Welcome to the State of the Nation, and once again, we've got a wonderful guest with us today. I am Mike Sham, host of the State of the Nation, and with me here today is John Andres. John, newly minted CEO of the SA Institute of Race Relations. Welcome to the State of the Nation. Thank you very much for inviting me, Mike. Great. And we're going to kick off with a question that I'm sure a lot of the people w watching us today are going to want to know. Mm -hmm. Who is the SA Institute of Race Relations and what do you do? Okay, so the SA Institute of Race Relations has been around for a very long time. It was founded in 1929 uh, with the purpose of studying the relationships between different groups in South Africa. And of course, already at that stage, you could see that race relations were important, even though it was long before apartheid. The Re Institute of Race Relations continued studying matters economic, uh, socio-economic, uh, rights related, all the way through the apartheid era and into the present, uh, and has always advocated for freedom and for the equal treatment of, of citizens. That was really its raison d'etre during the age of apartheid, and afterwards it is still continues to be the, 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 the essence of its message. It wants to promote freedom and the equal treatment of all South Africans. But where has the SAIRR, and we'll just call it the IRR yes. because <laughs> that's what most, uh, most people refer to you as, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't appear to me to be an overly muscular organization. You don't run off to court a lot. Well, we, we think there are two courts in which you fight your battles. And the one is the court of public opinion and the other is the court of law. Right. And often what uh, really makes the biggest difference is winning the battles in the court of public opinion because the opinions and the ideas that uh, dominate a society are what shape the policies and the policies are what shape the outcomes. So if you want to have an impact on the policy debate, you need to have the right ideas out there. And for that, you need to get those ideas out into the public domain in great volume and with very persuasive arguments and good facts and data in order to change the ideas that uh, determine policy. And that is really the, the court in which we are the most active. Okay, so um, I know that uh, you guys do write a lot. A lot, yes. Y a lot of pieces get published mm -hmm. in, the, in, in many of the, of the, certainly these days in the online uh, um, stuff. But let's, mm -hmm. just, let's just go back. Let's <laughs> just go back because obviously when people hear an organization that started in 1929, I think you said, mm -hmm. and uh, then you had an Institute of Race Relations through what was race obsessed and 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 mm. um, discriminatory legislation mm -hmm. what did the irr do between 1948 or, and 1994 well during that uh, time i mean it's a very long period yes. um, but certainly towards the latter end of that period i think that the irr because of its long history of data that it could access and its very good analysis was able to foresee the uh, eventual uh, denouement of how apartheid was going to end uh, and could spot the internal uh, contradictions in the system. So the uh, CEO at the time, John Kane Berman, I think very astutely predicted that the system was not going to be able to survive, not so much because of external pressure, which of course was also present, but because internally it couldn't handle the contra contradictions it was creating, for example, on the economic front. So in other words, you know, you want to have a, a growing economy, um, you know, being the apartheid government, but you're excluding the largest section of your workforce from that economy. So you're not going to get one. Um, and ultimately, these kinds of, of problems really broke down the system. You saw very be uh, deep budget deficits, for example, towards the end of the apartheid era. As the government ra ran out of money, it couldn't continue financing its own activities. And that is what, what brought about its downfall. So you guys were just like the commentators in a sports match. Yeah, I think probably a little bit more aggressive than that. Um, so I think we were quite um, outspoken in um, also criticizing the policies of the government at the same time as we were pointing out the, the, the weaknesses in the system that made it unsustainable. And I think you know, that, that really helped to bring it down. At the same time, also often uh, abroad, people weren't quite aware of what was going on in South Africa because you know, data, statistics, information wasn't that widely available. And the IRR published a compendium of statistics on South Africa called the South Africa Survey, which it started publishing in 1947 and published annually all through the age of apartheid and continues to publish today, which really tells you in detail what's happening in the country. You know, how, how are different regions developing? Um, how are different race groups developing? Um, so it goes across education, health, demographics, the economy, living standards, and all sorts of areas. And where do you get that data from? 
It's mostly from public sources. Um, so there's a, a, a range of organizations, of course, that collect data in South Africa. Uh, not all of that data is publicly available, um, but sometimes you know, we, we are able to leverage um, so, uh, uh, ways of, of uh, accessing the data, which we collate into that uh, document. Um, we also do our own polling and have been doing so for the past 20 years or so um, in order to understand better what is driving South Africans, what their, their hopes and desires, aspirations are, and also what drives the relationships between the different races in South Africa, for example. Uh, and some of those findings, I think, are quite unexpected. Uh, you know, us being in South Africa, we, we have a, quite a strong impression, I think, that you know, race relations are deteriorating from year to year. Things are really terrible. People hate each other and would be at each other's throats, given the chance. But that is not what the polling shows. The polling shows that most South Africans actually do get along quite well. Uh, we ask people, for example, um, have you experienced racism personally in the past five years? And most people are able to say no. We ask people, have race relations improved since 1994? And most people are able to say yes. Um, we also see that the things that people are interested in addressing in the country are held in common across race groups. So it is issues like um, unemployment, for example, crime and safety, and really um, basic service delivery issues like education, healthcare, infrastructure, water, really the basics. That is what dominates people's interest at the top of the list. At the bottom of the list are the racial issues, the inequality, and also the land reform. So what you're highlighting there would, I suppose, one would call the, the disconnect mm. between the headlines and, uh, and, and life as it's lived on the ground. Correct, yes. And you know, you'd, you'll also know, Mike, that the, the kind of feeling we've got at the moment in South Africa, the mood in the nation, I think, is quite glum um, and a bit despondent. Uh, and one of the things I think we should take heart in is our fellow South Africans. Um, because once you get away from the headlines and you get away from the grandstanding politicians uh, and you think about the ordinary people in the street, the people that you interact with every day, South Africans are pretty decent uh, uh, folk who share many of the same interests and I think really also have an interest in seeing South Africa develop into a different kind of country that works much better than it is working at the moment. Yeah, but obviously within this we've, we've, we've got uh, some very powerful, very vocal animated politicians yes and i presume <laughs> there it was quite uh, quite tactful of me but uh, Very, their yes. entire life's work is to keep the pot boiling isn't it yes that is absolutely right and um you know that that is also a tactic that can work um yeah. but i think there's maybe a, a, an observation to share on that here in south africa which is that we have you know 75 percent youth unemployment our general unemployment level is around 46%, and um, that is including people who have uh, uh, given up looking for work. Uh, our incomes have stagnated over the past decade, um, and so, you know, socioeconomically, we're not in a good space. This is a very fertile environment for a populist, redistributive message, um, you know, to, to work as a political message. And not only is the environment fertile for that kind of message and receptive, at the same time, we've also got a party that presents that message very convincingly. You know, we've got a very charismatic leader in the form of Julius Malema, who's also very tactically astute. I think you know, he's one, one of the politically most astute politicians in South Africa. His branding is spot on. You know, if you look at the campaign posters of various, election, uh, of various political parties, I think the EFF parties are, are really the best. Simple messages, clear color schemes. It is immediately apparent what it's about. Um, uh, and Julius Malema himself is also very charismatic. Mm -hmm. So you say you've got these two things. You've got the perfect conditions, you've got the perfect medium, you've got the perfect messenger, and yet support for the EFF doesn't get far beyond the 10% mark. And part of the reason for that, I think, is that the population is not receptive to the message. It is not receptive to the message of division, polarization, um, extreme redistribution um, that, that is being presented by that party. Well, you know, John, um, I lived through uh, through the 80s and, and and even into the early 90s, and if you know the the, the the sort of talk that has become almost accepted as as gospel these days yeah. that we were on the verge of a civil war could was nowhere near the the, the facts. We had deep unrest, but mm -hmm. it was in no way threatening to spill out into the streets in some kind of major pitched battle. This was hardly Sarajevo. Well, we did kind of get a civil war after 1990. 
Yes. You know, so I mean, that's really when, when, when the, the, the big conflict started, I think. But even that was, was region, regionalized, yeah. and it was, it was really a power grab as opposed to an uprising against the system. Yeah. You know, there was, I suppose, the IFP versus the ANC for who was going to control the KZN, rural KZN. Yeah, and I think it was really the, the ANC asserting itself yeah. as the legitimate uh, successor to the NP, to the National Party, and making sure that its competitors did not have a, a chance. Um, so the IFP was, I think, the main focus of that. Um, but it did cost many, many lives, and it was like a, it was internal strife within South Africa. But it always amazed me that, mm. that even something like that failed to spill over. Yeah, and it could have gone, you know, far worse if you think about it. Um, well, could it? I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you kind of had, and, and just as a sort of a, mm. without sort of uh, splitting hairs, it wasn't to succeed control from the ANC. It was actually, mm -hmm. there was no control. Those were areas that uh, I don't think had seen much governance one way or the other. Mm. I suppose you had a proxy government in the IFP, but, uh, um, but no matter, the point is that, that uh, this, this South Africa remains a country with high levels of goodwill. Yes. That's yeah. not recognized enough. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, the easy go-to um, um, bruise to poke is, is to say, well, yeah, we're on the edge of some kind of racial uprising, mm. which I don't think we're even uh, uh, close to in South Africa. Is that your finding? Yeah, um, I, I would agree with that. Um, of course, then we, we have to think about July last year, yeah. uh, you know, and the, the, the riots and unrest that happened there. Um, and I think uh, it would be wrong to present that, I think, as an outright uh, conspiracy to overthrow the government. I think that's not what it was. I think there was some political forces involved in it, but the way it um, unfolded, I think, really was um, pretty uncontrolled and ultimately driven more by opportunism than by a plan. Um, and I think you know, that also speaks to your point. This was not, uh, I think, a, a, a racial conflict. Um, you, you might argue that in some parts it, was, it might have been a class conflict. And I was surprised not to see political parties understand that. But you remember those scenes where you had sort of uh, property owners armed with firearms standing on a bridge with a group of people approaching them. And I mean, that was class warfare. Mm -hmm. This was property owners versus <laughs> people yeah. who don't own property uh, but th it was something the EFF didn't comment on the ANC didn't comment on um, so you know I think that, that that was overlooked in that yeah now I know that mm. uh, you're not um, you do a lot of analysis you're not mm. there just uh, you know you're not a political analyst as such mm. um, but um, it it feels like uh, uh, much of what we see today uh, and the, the, the uprising KZN mm -hmm. sort of brought it out wasn't so much, um, uh, it, it seems like what's up, what's back up for grabs is the old IFP supporter that supported Jacob Zuma mm -hmm. um, under the guise of the ANC, and they're now back up for grabs by the looks of things. Yeah, and I mean, if, if you look at the, at the um, poll, no, not the polling, at the election results in KwaZulu-Natal, it used to be that KZN was a drag on the ANC in the sense that the ANC performed at higher levels in the rest of the country than in KZN because of, of the IFP mainly. That changed under, under Jacob Zuma, where it became you know, a, a, a strong support base for the ANC. But then I think um, as Zuma left, that has been dropping again. And as you say, now you've got this kind of political vacuum in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, where there are lots of votes up for grabs in KZN, and, and uh, you know, somebody wants to grab them, but yeah. who's going to get them? Is yeah. it going to be you know, Zuma supporters? Will it be IFP? Is it going to be the rest of the of the ANC, um, and I think that that is what that conflict was about. Okay, mm. but now now let's 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 mm. take the conversation back to the IRR. Mm -hmm. um, it it would seem to many that the IRR is um, uh, almost an English version of Afri Forum. Mm. Is that something you've heard many times? Well, I mean, it's it's a, I think a really interesting um, th thing to debate and think about. Um, Afri Forum and the IRR, I think sometimes run in parallel and sometimes in opposition to one another. So I think there was a period in time where, where they worked well together, then there was a time when they were at each other's throats um, and didn't work so well together. Um, so I think there are some commonalities, but there are also some important differences. Um, the commonalities certainly are, for example, around property rights. So Afri Forum is very concerned about expropriation without compensation, and so is the IRR. 
And that is one area, for example, where both organizations worked very forcefully in order to push back against that, that kind of uh, policy initiative and legislation. Um, where maybe there is a difference is that I think the IRR um, still very much has an inclusive uh, view of South Africa's unitary state, which I think our reform is beginning to question um, for good reason. You know, if you, if you look at the way the administration is failing large parts of the country, it is not an unreasonable conclusion to say, well, you know, if you can't trust the central government, you better sort things out for yourself. You know, you've got to identify your community, make sure that you're okay, and then, you know, what happens in the rest of the country is, is bad, but, you know, it's not something we can stop. Yeah. And as the IRR, we still pursue the idea that South Africans, that all South Africans should have a good future within South Africa. Um, it does mean that communities also have to take um, initiative, in many cases, to fix, for example, things in their surroundings because they're not being fixed by the municipality. But we don't think communities should be isolated from one another uh, or indeed too clearly delineated. In other words, it's not this group, that group, and, and the other group that uh, are, are distinct from one another and communicate across the wall or boundary between them, but rather that you have individuals interacting freely, uh, no matter what group they belong to. So would you call the IRR um, proponents of the Rainbow Nation idea? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a really, I think, uh, an idea that has fallen out of favor. Um, and you could also criticize that the colors of the rainbow don't really mix, so <laughs> they do stay apart. Um, but the idea, you know, that you have all South Africans being able to have a good future within the country, I think that is something I would agree with. Um, and once again, coming back to the polling, I think there's a lot of uh, support for that idea that many South Africans, you know, do not want to retreat into, into uh, enclaves or, or, or little communal groups. You know, we see the value in being part of this country and wanting, wanting to make it work. So yeah, Rainbow Nation, getting along, yeah, getting along I think is part of it. Well, you know, look, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful idea. The question mm -hmm. is whether, whether it, it, uh, it is appropriate for a, a, mm -hmm. a world in which we are being pushed further and further to the margins. Mm. And uh, let's just take some of the, the, the more recent sort of uh, headline grabbers. Mm. Uh, where would um, the Institute of Race Relations stand on something like struggle songs? Mm. I mean, we, we had a, a little discussion around that yesterday, uh, which is usually always scheduled to be last about an hour or so. I think it lasted three or four hours. So in other words, um, freedom of speech is a really difficult issue to get your head around if you get into the detail. Um, you can say that, that there's a spectrum on freedom of speech where on the one hand, the one extreme might be people who say, you know, anybody should be allowed to say anything at any time with no consequences and, and that's fine. That would be really an extreme position. Um, and the other op extreme would be where you say, you know, speech has to be constrained and there have to be rules around what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. The IRR certainly um, tends to be more on the free speech end of that spectrum, but I think does recognize, for example, that defamation is something that, you know, should be uh, sanctionable, not, not forbidden, but sanctionable uh, in a society. Uh, if somebody makes unfounded accusations against somebody, you know, harming their, their image, um, you know, there should be legal recourse for that. Um, when it comes to the struggle songs, um, really tricky. So I, not all of us at the IRR share the same view on that. We have some colleagues who say, you know, let people sing those songs, let them get it out in the open so that you know where they stand. Don't hide it away, don't suppress it. Rather, let it be visible so you can oppose it in the court of public opinion rather than a legal court. And others say there is actually an important distinction between general communication and speech and giving instructions to somebody, using the imperative mode of a, of a word, for example. Go kill that man. It's an instruction to go and do something. And that is maybe something that is concerning and where the law should get involved. Um, probably the Constitution gives us quite a good framework for, for handling that kind of thing because what it says is that incitement to do harm is one of the things that is not protected as free speech. In other words, if you do say, you know, kill that person, as that song literally says, um, that would be a problem. What muddies the waters is, is it an instruction or is it, you know, a chant, a song, a, something that, that creates a feeling of solidarity and identif identification within the group? which I think is what the, the FF side is going to argue. You know, we're not instructing our people to literally go out and kill people. 
yes. because you wouldn't be allowed to. Yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. And you've got those, those really, I think, concerning statements from Julius Malema um, at, at that, uh, that cross-examination. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, just sort of thinking and more sort of comment than anything. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, is uh, Julius Malema a budding future president or is he just Eugene Ter Blanche in a different skin tone? I think his ambitions do go in that direction. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if he's going to get there. Well, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting and obviously mm -hmm. uh, they are now past the, the point of being a new movement. They're mm -hmm. now well established, part mm -hmm. of the infrastructure and uh, with an ailing ANC, one would imagine that um, mm -hmm. their message should gain traction. But uh, back to the on the ground um, mm -hmm. um, situations in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, clearly what we are seeing, as we said, was was a, a greater move away from centrist politics. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that internationally. We're seeing it in South Africa. You know the. The, the, the sort of uh, movement, if you look at the Republican Party in America, mm. you know, it's become, it's unrecognizable from the Republican parties of, of the past, which were to the right, but inclusive. Mm. And, uh, and if you look at the Democratic Party, where it was, you know, to the left, but inclusive, mm. nowadays they, they operate seemingly at the extremes with politicians ready to move them even further mm. away from where they are. Mm. You know, you, you get the feeling that um, the next Republican candidate might uh, start getting them to wear brown shirts and, uh, you know, the next Democratic uh, thing might want them to, to wear berets. Um, mm -hmm. Are you guys monitoring this kind of change in, in political uh, behavior, this global trend? I mean, certainly we, we do follow the global trends um, quite closely uh, and we, we observe what you're saying. I think that this is a trend that is observable at the moment. I think it's not clear yet how it's going to end up playing out. Um, that degree of polarization seems to be far more extreme in the United States, for example, than in most European countries. Um, if you think of German politics, for example, um, you do see extremist movements as well. Um, but they're not, they are, they are on the fringes. They are marginal parties. And it doesn't look like they're going to be able to pull the center apart to the two sides. Um, but rather that the center still remains quite, quite, quite solid. Um, and within South Africa, I mean, for us, for, for so many years, I think the ANC has really been the, the center of attention. Um, it is left of center, and I think most of the political spectrum has been shifted left of center as well. Uh, something that we are looking out for and watching is whether the vacuum that exists right of center is going to be filled. Because, you know, in terms of values, many South Africans, I think, are conservative, small c conservative, rather than on the left. You know, they, they value things like uh, their religion, their family, their home, you know, their work. It's sort of, you know, middle class values, uh, I suppose you could call them. Um, but there doesn't seem to be really a party that caters to that. Well, mm. um, we could argue that uh, the previous man that sat in that very seat uh, just a few weeks back was uh, Herman Mashaba. Yes who you feel is um, really pitching at that particular part of, uh, of the market. Exactly. You know, which is roughly where um, I, I've always got to smile when, you know, if you could cast your mind back 30 years ago, if you would mm. call the DA or the D DP or the PFP as <laughs> they were then as right of center, you know, you'd mm. be laughed out of town. They were the original lefties. Did they work, yeah. um, but uh, then I suppose the Republicans were the party of Abraham Lincoln that abolished slavery. So mm. parties also change like people do. Mm. Um, but certainly Herman Mashaba and uh, Action SA are pitching themselves as being right of center. Yeah. Um, there's going to be an interesting debate around two issues, mm -hmm. and I'd be very interested to know what your views are. One being this um, surge of um, of South African firstism. Mm -hmm. It's not quite xenophobia yet. We haven't started burning people. That's always just uh, not too far behind in South Africa. But you know, we've seen the, uh, you know mass vigilante movements starting mm -hmm. to emerge. We see that uh, a party like the EFF that were, mm -hmm. were staunchly pro-African suddenly pitch up at restaurants to mm -hmm. do audits of, uh, of foreign workers. Um, where are we on, where do you guys stand on mm -hmm. 
illegal immigrants? Um, so I, th I think firstly in support of what you said earlier, I do think that Herman Mashaba is appealing to that right of center audience. Um, and I think that the successes he had in the local government elections do lend some credence to the idea that there is a market there um, that is untapped. Uh, I also think that what we saw since the beginning of the year in terms of various other parties hopping on the anti-foreigner bandwagon is a reflection of them saying, oh, you know, maybe there's some voters there that we should go and speak to. Uh, and we saw the EFF do it. Uh, we saw the IFP do it. We saw um, the Patriotic Alliance do it. And we even saw the ANC do it. You know, they're also now tightening up laws and eliminating loopholes in order to be seen to be uh, taking action against uh, foreigners effectively. Um, the, the way I would see it um, is that much of the, dis the narrative on dysfunction around foreigners in South Africa is created not by the foreigners, but by the dysfunction of the South African state. So I'll, I'll break that down. What I mean by that is if somebody commits a crime, law enforcement has to investigate, prosecute, if necessary, sentence and convict that person. And this remains true independent of whether the perpetrator was a South African or a foreigner. But because law enforcement is so weak in South Africa, it is easy to point at the foreigners and say, look, those foreigners are engaged in crime. Uh, you know, be it Zimbabweans or the Nigerians, it's easy to point those fingers uh, and, and accuse these entire groups of people of, of being involved in illicit activity. I think that those blanket accusations wouldn't be as easily possible if law enforcement were more effective in South Africa. So it's the failure, it's state failure that is causing these narratives to be even plausible, to be even feasible. Um, in terms of what I think needs to happen is, I'm sure that we do have a very large uh, population of illegal foreigners or undocumented uh, people from abroad. I think many of them have been here for many, many years. I think most of them keep their heads down because why would they want to draw attention to themselves? I think that most of them are you know, working hard, trying not to be noticed uh, and, and trying to provide for themselves and often for their families abroad as well. To kick them out as the more radical parties are proposing, I think would be a grave injustice to those people and it will also be harmful to the interests of South Africa as well, both on the international stage and also in terms of the economic contribution that these people make. The correct approach in my view would be to say, if you've been living here for a number of years and you are not committing crimes, then we must find a way to regularize your stay in South Africa. You know, why can't we have a system like the United States where after a few years, you can become naturalized. Let's make these people South Africans. Let's make them part of the community. Um, the problem it doesn't solve is entry control. In other words, you know, if, if you're going to have a certain uh, regime in terms of how you deal with immigrants, you need to enforce that, and that's not happening at the moment. So what we have is a, is a sort of a split system where if you are trying to come here as a, an expatriate representative of a global company, you're following all the rules, crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's, and still you can't get your visa because the process is so difficult and so it takes so long and you don't get an answer, et cetera, et cetera, keeping out the wrong people. On the other hand, if you're able to walk across the border, it is quite easy. And it's a crazy system, you know, it's not doing us any favors. So what we need to do, I think, really is um, figure out what we want, treat the people already here fairly, and then implement a good system. Yeah, look, uh, I suppose there's a, there's a bigger question that underpins all of this, and that mm. is that uh, I think South Africa really needs to decide whether it's a country of laws or not. Yes. Because if we decide it's a country of laws, things become real easy. You've yep. got your laws and you apply them. Yes, and Simple we've got the and laws, but we've we don't got apply the laws, them. but we don't <laughs> apply them. And exactly. in actual fact, as uh, Lindiwe Sisulu showed the other day, yeah. is that those meant to uphold the laws and swear on the Constitution uh -huh. don't really believe in it. So I think we're going to have a, a real battle to, to, to get um, our government to implement those laws again. Mm. Mm. But uh, let's, just, let's just once again, just to sort of, uh, as we sort of move to the, the, you know, the end of our discussion mm -hmm. is the IR and its relevance, mm -hmm. right? Um, we are talking about race relations. You guys are sort of like that, uh, you know, I, I made the analogy of being a commentator in a sports match, um, maybe a little bit more than that, but mm -hmm. not as muscular as some of the other bodies. Mm -hmm. Are you doing yourselves 
any favors by being so white? <laughs> um, so I think firstly I would respond that our attitude is very much a non-racialist one. And so we would say that indistinctly of your <coughs> skin color, you should be treated as, a, as an individual, as a person, and for what you can contribute. And I think that is something that the IRR does very well. So if I think of my colleagues, um, I don't think of them as being black or white or any of the other races. I think of them in terms of their individual characteristics. And um, the, the, the team we have at the IRR is a really exceptional one. Um, very um, diverse. We've got lawyers, we've got philosophers, we've got economists, we've got all kinds of people. Um, but what they all have in common, I think, is that they buy into the ideal of treating people as individuals fairly with respect, with maximum freedom, and not on the basis of race or any other immutable characteristics. So that would be my first response. In terms of the muscularity, um, so you know, we've got almost half a million subscribers around our various, uh, across our various platforms. We wrote over 1,300 op-eds last year. We published nine submissions to Parliament. Um, we put out uh, a daily podcasts uh, on YouTube, on podcast channels, and so on. Uh, and we reach uh, millions of people in South Africa. So we do have the footprint, and this is the battle that we want to be fighting. We want to be in the idea space. We want to be putting out the ideas about what sort of policies would work better in South Africa. Um, and the question, I think the challenge for us is to grow that footprint further and to make sure that our ideas are perceived and received in the public square with the uh, attention that they deserve. Well, uh, John, all I can say is let's hope they do because I think the work you do is important. Um, and the message you are trying to send out is one that is very positive for South Africa. It's what, it's what got us here mm. um, and what did lead South Africa down the right path for many years towards great economic growth mm -hmm. and uh, um, um, wealth creation as well as um, a better life for many South Africans. And uh, mm. since we've turned our back on it, the proof has been in the pudding. The country has gone in the other direction. Uh, we now have exclusionary, we now have uh, unrest, etc., and a absolutely critical unemployment rate yeah. um, that's, that's not helping anybody. Yeah. So let's just hope that, uh, that, that, that people are listening to you and that you guys can keep on growing. Let me make one concluding remark, if mm, I may, please. which is at the moment that the policies we've got are diametrically opposed to getting the results that we want. In other words, for example, we're trying to get investment but we've got expropriation without compensation as our investment strategy. We're trying to get more employment, but we've got restrictive labor laws <laughs> as our employment strategy. Uh, we've, you know, we're trying to, to get better education, but we've got centralized education that's terrible. Across the board, we're, we're doing the wrong things at the moment. Yeah, mm. and uh, yeah. you wanted to, now we're in extra time, <laughs> people, so stick around. <laughs> now, this always <laughs> happens. But uh, yes. in essence, I suppose, what we're really what you're highlighting is something that I think not a lot of people are understanding. Mm -hmm. And that is that, um, you know, it's all fair and well. You know, like I said to somebody the other day that we decide that we're going to, we, you know, my, I make a comment to you and I say, let's, uh, let's have a game on Saturday. And you say, that's fine. And you pitch mm -hmm. up with your golf clubs and I pitch up with my tennis racket, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. It's a bit difficult for us to then play that game when you're trying to hit a golf ball mm -hmm. and I'm trying to play tennis. Mm -hmm. and we're not playing the same game. And I think at the moment we've got a government mm -hmm. that really wishes it was 1965 mm -hmm. and they were part of the Soviet bloc. Yes. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. But yet they've got a whole lot of rules that, uh, that are set to run a modern country. Yeah. They are ill-equipped to do that. They're trying to adjust to a small degree. They can't. Yeah, and you know, I, it used to be the idea that you had to own the means of production. Yeah. Right? I think that I don't think that's the idea anymore. But you want to control the means of production. That means you have you know lots of rules, lots of taxes, lots of regulations, in order to make sure that you can guide the development of the country the way that you think is right. And this is exactly what's not working out at the moment. It is the fear of letting companies do the things they do best freely, the fear of letting citizens do the things they do best freely, that is stopping us from developing. You know? And that is, that is really at the, at the very core of the problem that we've got at the moment, is we're trying to be, the government is trying to be too helpful. You know, it's trying to say, you know, you've got to fix the unemployment. Let's, you yeah. know, have job creation problems. Let's, uh, uh, we want investment, so let's have investment conferences. Yes. That doesn't work. I think we've, uh, got to, I think we've got to acknowledge that we've been here before. Mm. 
Right, we were there in the 80s when, uh, when the National Party uh, still wanted to run the country as if it was the 50s and then it was the 80s and the world had moved on. Mm. Uh, what had worked back then no longer applied. And um, until the day before they, uh, they, they announced uh, Nelson Mandela's release, mm. they were still holding on to this idea that they could uh, run this nationalist government Mm. which had been popular as a movement in the 20s and 30s and reached its, its mm. zenith under Hitler mm. of being a national socialist party in a modern world that had moved away from it. Now, I suppose we've got the same thing again. You've got the mm. ANC being this communist party in waiting, trying to expel on the next, what's it, the national democratic revolution in a world that doesn't need more revolutions. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's also this idea of, of being able to pick winners so, you know, governments think, you know, we must pick a winner in this industry or that race group or whatever the case might be. And that's a terrible way of going about things because governments are not good at picking winners. They're too slow and too big and it's too complicated. You can't figure it out. You've got to let people figure it out for themselves. You need to give people the freedom to interact with each other and to build these emerging solutions out of the interactions. Um, during the lockdowns, American unemployment spiked. People were very worried about that, obviously. But I was sure that it was going to come down very quickly as well. And why, d why did that happen? Because it's pretty free. It's you know, free for all. It, it looks messy. But ultimately what happens is that you're able to, to let people get on with it. And then, then you can solve even the biggest problems. And John, I suppose in closing, we can all agree on one thing. It, it comes down to one thing only. Mm. It comes down to the money. Mm. Um, there, there comes a time when governments just run out of money to do what they're doing and if their um, policies and actions are out of line with what the money wants them to do, they will fall by the wayside. And we saw that in the 80s with the National Party. Mm. They stopped doing what business wanted them to do. They stopped doing what national, international investors wanted them to do. Mm. And we saw massive disinvestment. We saw spiking um, deficits, etc. And eventually you are kicked you're dragged kicking and screaming down the road that you should have just walked down in the <laughs> first place. Mm -hmm. Or your only other option is where you just take the Zimbabwe route and you just say, look, we don't care. We're going to go down to naught, but as long as we're in charge. Yeah. But I suppose right now um, we've got a country that's in economic crisis, mm -hmm. fiscal crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I suppose many of the things that you that we all hope will happen will come to pass um, because it's the only way, I'd imagine. I think there's a chance. You know, I think there's no certainty about that, but I think we're approaching a kind of tipping point where the government has run out of money, it's run out of ideas, it's run out of electricity, and, and something's got to give. You know? And one thing that could give is democracy. So you turn into Zimbabwe and just say, it doesn't actually matter what the economy does, we just make sure we stay in power. Mm. Or what gives is going to be the government and the, the economic policies which get replaced with something better that works better. But it, it feels like we are approaching that point, yes. But I suppose mm. before we scare the hell out of our viewers, the likelihood of the, um, of the Zimbabwe style mm. outcome is not that great given our poor military. Yeah, I, I think that's one reason. Um, and I, I also think that within the ANC there is a certain uh, commitment to democracy and desire to be a democratic movement. So, you know, we, we often g get this question about uh, when the ANC loses an election, will it let go of power? Um, and at the moment, I'm inclined to say yes, I think it will. Well, it's looking more and more to me like they can't wait to give away <laughs> power because they <laughs> it's become a burden. It has but been, John, yes. thank you so much for your time today. I've really had a wonderful chat. I hope everybody out there has enjoyed it as much as we are. We would like to thank our sponsors, Trade Nation, Blackstone Futures, if you want to trade markets, go visit their website. You'll see their ad um, before and after this particular um, uh, broadcast. But thank you so much for joining us today. And we'll be back with another look at the state of the nation. John Andrus, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, thank Mike. You.
to the new world.